Well, good morning again. Good morning. Are you excited to be here this morning? Amen. I'm excited to be here. Uh, Mike asked me, you know, Mike and Missy asked me to preach today. I'm, I'm just so thrilled to have this opportunity to come and open God's Word and preach with you. Uh, since this is the first time I've preached here, I always like to introduce myself just a little bit so you get an understanding of, of, of who it is that's here before you opening the Word of God. My name is Kevin E. Grant. Uh, I'm a pastor. I was, I've been a bivocational pastor for, Beverly, what is it, 22 years now? Sounds, sounds something like that. Uh, I was uh, born again in the backyard Bible school at eight years of age. Rededicated my life to the Lord when I was a teenager. When I was a senior in high school, I was actually called into what I believed at the time was going to be full-time music ministry. Uh, then I went to Liberty University, studied my undergrad. I graduated from Liberty University with a degree in music education. And went on to grad school, and I spent a few years, sadly, running from the Lord. And after I left Florida State University, I moved to Winchester, Virginia, where I've lived ever since. I, I met and married Beverly Grant uh, in First Baptist Church of uh, Winchester, and uh, we've been living in Winchester since 1990. I've been here since 91, and we were married in 94. And I was ordained, first in ministry and ordained, actually just about 22 years ago this week. And I've been serving the Lord in various churches in a bivocational ministry ever since. First as a music minister, uh, then associate pastor for music and worship, and then a church planter. And most recently, senior pastor at Amazing Grace Baptist Church in Cape and Bridge, West Virginia, where Beverly and I served eight and a half years. Now, that's just a little bit about me. Let me ask you a question. And you don't have to answer this, just ponder this. Is anything I just said any reason why you should accept anything that I say this morning? And the answer actually is no. You know, it's, it's, it's easy for a person to get up and say, I've been ordained and I've been to Bible school and I've been to seminary and I've got this and that degree. But that doesn't necessarily mean that when you get up and you preach that what you're saying is authoritative. There's only one standard that should test whether anybody in this pulpit, myself, Pastor Mike, or any other pastor, what they say is authoritative, and that's the Word of God. So that's what I'm here to present for you this morning. I want to open the Word of God with you this morning. Now, I, I, when I preach and teach the Word of God, my, uh, my Bible study and teaching method is a little bit different. I like to ask questions about the Word of God. Questions that I don't hear many people asking, and I want you to be feel free in your mind to ask these questions this morning because we're going to ask some of them. Like, why did the Bible say it that way? Why is that included in the Bible that way and maybe not something else? If I were in their shoes, how would I do it differently? So as we look at this passage this morning, we're going to be looking at a familiar story to you. I'm going to ask you to take a fresh look at it this morning as we look at this passage. The title of the sermon this morning is Obeying God. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1. As we're going to see a familiar story from a familiar character in the Christmas story but we want to see if we can uh, shed some new light on this story through our study this morning. As you turn there, let me start with this story to set up what we're about to say. Jill Jones wrote a, a fab, about a fabulously wealthy American newspaper publisher named James Gordon Bennett. In 1835, Bennett started the famous newspaper called the New York Herald. Now, he had two lavish apartments in Paris, plus a French country estate and a yacht harbor in Europe. He also had three homes in the U.S., even though he hadn't lived in the country for 10 years. Now, by my counting, that's seven different homes. Fabulously wealthy man. But the servants in each of his homes always needed to be prepared for Bennett's unexpected arrival. Jones wrote, each house was fully staffed, ready to serve Bennett, should he stride in the front door unannounced. The wine cellars were kept stocks, fires roared in the grates, and the street the sheets were turned down nightly. So imagine what it's like working for this man, being one of his servants. He's not necessarily at that home. There's really little chance that he'll actually come and stay there that night, having seven different homes a, a, an ocean apart. Yet you have to be ready at any moment in case he comes home. As we start the story this morning and we introduce the Christmas story, I want us to set the stage and understand this is how the nation of Israel 
was living. For hundreds of years, they had been anticipating the promise of the Messiah from God. And they had to be constantly vigilant, constantly ready. Their land was occupied by the Roman government. Although Pax Romana allowed them to practice their faith and their religion freely and peaceably, they still were subject to the ultimate authority of Rome. So the Israelites resented the presence of Rome. And so they all secretly longed for the Messiah to come as the conquering king, to drive out the invaders, to set up and reestablish the throne of his father David, and to establish his eternal kingdom. They were looking for the Messiah, and they had to stay ever vigilant and ever ready. This is the scene as we go into, dive into Luke chapter 1, and we hear the story of Zechariah. We're going to be reading, and I apologize for the lengthy passage, but we need to hear the whole story, verses 5 through 25 and 57 to 66. So in honor and reverence to God's holy word, would you stand with me, please? Reading from the New International Version. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Both were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by a lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home, and after this his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Skipping down to verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard it wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
I thank you for the birth of John the Baptist and the great miracle that you showed. Father, as we dive into this story this morning, help us to see it with fresh eyes. Open our hearts to understand the lessons that you would have us learn from this passage this morning as we celebrate in anticipation of the Christmas miracle. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, there's a couple questions that I like to ask about this passage as as we go into this. If you think about it, the, the editorial choice, look at the four Gospels. Each one of them tells the story of Jesus from a slightly different format. And this story of Zechariah is only found in the Gospel of Jude, Luke. Why was it included here? Why was this uh, story happened this way? And what if something like this actually happened to me? Have you ever thought that about the Bible? Have you ever put yourself in the place of the characters in the Bible? What would I do in their shoes? I think there's great lessons to be learned from this. I have four lessons that I believe God has, has prepared for us today from this passage. And the first lesson that we're going to look at is we, we understand as we start this story, God chose Zechariah. Now, that, that's just a matter of fact from Luke, but think about this. All the people in Israel who could have fulfilled this promise to be the mother and father of John the Baptist, and God chose Zechariah. After 400 years of silence, no prophecy, no prophet, no Bible written, God finally said, the time is right. I'm going to bring about the events that will ultimately lead to the coming of the Messiah, the sacrifice for sins and the resurrection from the dead. I need to choose a man who will do a job for me. So God goes looking and he finds Zechariah. Why did he choose Zechariah? I've highlighted some uh, words in the passage in blue to help us just a little bit here understand three characteristics about Zechariah that God saw when he looked at Zechariah. They are, first of all, both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Secondly, they were observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. And then thirdly, Zechariah was on duty and he was serving as priest before the Lord. So we see that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous. They were right before God. That's a legal term that says they were, they were regarded as not guilty before God. It's one thing if you go into court here and you are determined not guilty. You are righteous in human standards. It's another thing entirely to be determined as righteous by God's standards. God looked at Zechariah And Elizabeth, he said, they are righteous and they are blameless. Blameless meant they had observed the law. Like we talked about with the opening story. They were vigilant night and day to do what God told them to do. And then third, Zechariah was obeying God. He was doing the work that God had prepared for him. He was a Levite. He was a priest. And it was the job of the tribe of Levi to take care of the temple for the sacrifices and the worship before the Lord. When the people would come to present offerings to the Lord, it was the Levites and the priests within the Levites that would take care of those. And Zechariah was serving the Lord faithfully. He was doing his job. From his perspective, he's just a mild-mannered guy. He's just a Levite, just, you know, called, you know, Chosen my lot to be priest and offer incenses that day, incense that day. He's just doing his job, trying to do the best he can day in and day out. Sounds like a lot of people I know doing the best they can, trying to be honest, trying to live with integrity, trying to follow the Lord and do the best. When God's looking for someone to serve, the first truth that arises from this passage as we see this is there is a prerequisite for being used by God. Being blameless, being righteous, and being in service. Now let's pause just for a minute. Prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, does this apply to me? Am I ready? If you would ask me to do a great job, would I be ready? My sincere hope is that each one of us can say before a holy God, yes, Lord, I am ready. I meet the prerequisites to be used. Secondly in the story, we see that God allowed Zechariah to suffer. Zechariah and Elizabeth were suffering. There's only one verse that really references there, verse 7. You see it in blue. Um, They were childless 
because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and were both very old. Now, hidden in that one verse, especially in that culture in Israel that day, is great pain. Beverly and I were watching a movie the other night, and uh, Mel Gibson's had an adult daughter who was killed tragically. And he was sitting around talking with another man who was older and single and had no children. And the older man said to Mel Gibson's character at one point, I guess it would be better to be like me and not have any children to be, than to be like you and have children and have lost them. And Mel Gibson's character said, oh no, it was worth it. And what that really says is, as bad and awful as the pain, and there is no pain like it unless you've been uh, in that position, of a parent losing a child, the pain and ache of wanting children and not having children is even worse. That's what it was like for Zechariah and Elizabeth. And this is compounded by the culture they lived in. In the Jewish culture, to be childless, to be barren, meant that you were cursed by God because you had sinned. So Zechariah and Elizabeth lived as pariahs, even amongst the priestly Levite division, even in the holiness and blamelessness in the way that they lived their lives. People looked sideways at them and sneered at them and gossiped about them behind their back because she couldn't get pregnant. Something must be wrong with her. Now, we know in God's providence that God allowed, and this is the difficult part of the story for many people if you think about it. God allowed Elizabeth and Zechariah to be childless. Not for a month, not for a year, for decades. The Bible says they were old and advanced in years. So we see a second truth that arises from this. And this is one of the the truths that's universal in many ways in Scripture. Great pain often precedes a great move by God. Let me ask you a thought question right here. Suppose the Holy Spirit were to come to you today and, and, and God was to say this to you. In 25 years from today, I'm going to bless you in an amazing way and do a wondrous work in your life. But between now and 25 years from now, you are going to suffer greatly. What would be your response? Most people, I think, I I know I probably would say, no, thanks, but no thanks, I'd rather have ease. No, if God had asked Zachariah and Elizabeth, would you rather have a child when you're young and just live a normal, unremarkable life, or would you rather not have a child, wait 25 years, and then be blessed in an amazing way by God? I think Zachariah and Elizabeth most probably said, thanks, but no thanks, let's give us a child now. A lot of people don't count the price as worth it. But God didn't give Zechariah a choice, did he? They were just barren and they ached day in and day out for a child. So we see that the preparation for this story, the amazing miracle that's to come, and the birth of John the Baptist was a miracle. Make no mistake about that. Great pain preceded a great move by God. And then, thirdly, we see God sent a messenger. Now, Zechariah was chosen by Lot to be the one to go in to the altar of incense and burn the daily incense. And just so you understand a little bit of background, if if you're not familiar with the temple worship, there were three areas in the temple. There was the outer courtyard where the nation of Israel would go, and there they would interact with the Levites and the priests, and they would give their offerings to God. Then in the building itself, the temple, there was the holy place. This is where the furniture sat. The golden lampstands, the great sea, and the altar of incense, which we see here. And the altar of incense had to have incense burning on it, according to the law, night and day, as a symbol of the continuous prayers of the people of God, rising as a sweet sweet, uh, aroma into his nostrils. And so a priest had to go into the holy place, and only the priests could go there, and only for official business, and would have to do the the work to make sure that the the incense was continually burning. And of course, the third place is the most holy place. That's where God himself sat on the mercy seat. And the Shekinah glory of God sat there. And only the high priest could go to the most holy place once a year. But Zechariah was in the holy place. He was burning incense on the altar of incense. And something happened which startled him. Nobody else was supposed to be there. He was supposed to be alone. Nobody else except the priests were allowed to be there because it was a holy place before the Lord God. And all of a sudden, there's a man appearing. Now, 
The Bible says he was scared and he was terrified. So my guess is Gabriel probably looked like an angel. You know, the Bible says a lot of, a lot of times angels appear, they look like men. I, did he have wings? Mm, probably not. Was he glowing? Maybe. But something about his presence scared Zechariah, and he knew he was in the presence of an angel. And look at the message. And once again, I've highlighted this in blue here for us that Gabriel brings. Gabriel first says, do not be afraid. Then he says to Zechariah, a personal message. Your prayer has been heard. And then he says, Elizabeth will bear you a son. You're going to have a baby. Now, I don't know how old he is. Let's say he, in that day he's 50, 55 years old, and Elizabeth is too. That was startling news to him. And I, you know, then he goes on to... Gabriel goes on to say a whole bunch of things about how great John the Baptist is going to be. And if I had been in Zachariah's shoes, I would have not been able to hear anything past, you're going to have a kid. <laughs> and so, and the truth is, all those things in yellow there about how amazing John the Baptist is, that's a whole other sermon. Today's about Zachariah and his reaction. So let's look at those three things. Obviously, Gabriel had to say, do not be afraid, because Zachariah recognized something of a super supernatural presence right there. And then he says something very personal that's kind of ironic when you consider what Zachariah was doing. Zachariah is there tending the altar of incense, making sure that it continues to burn and offer the prayers before God. And Gabriel comes and says, your personal prayer, your most intimate, aching, longing of your heart has been heard. What if God came to you and said, you know that thing you want the most in this whole world? I'm going to give it to you. That's the message that Zechariah heard. Make no mistake about it. This is what Zechariah and Elizabeth as a couple wanted more than anything else in the world. They wanted a child. And Gabriel delivers the message that Gabriel had been longing to hear for decades Elizabeth is going to bear a son. How would you react if God came and gave that message to you? I'm going to propose at this time an alternate ending to the story, and it could have happened this way, but didn't. Zechariah startled, looks at the angel Gabriel and says, much like Mary said, may it be to me as the Lord wills. And then leaves the holy place, and goes out, probably doesn't tell anybody, goes home and tells his wife Elizabeth, she gets pregnant, she gives birth to John the Baptist. But the amazing wonder of this story is never announced to the people. John the Baptist just kind of shows up out of nowhere, preaching before Jesus comes. It could have happened that way. So why didn't it happen that way? It's pretty obvious that God wanted this miracle made public. So Zechariah makes a mistake. So we see here the next essential truth is this, and this is another difficult truth for us to internalize. God only gives us one chance to get it right the first time. Now he gives us unlimited second chances. Our God is the God of second chances, and I'm so grateful for that because I don't know about you, but I'm on plan like Q yeah. right now or something like that. You know, I mean, he gives us second chances over and over and over again. He's a wonderful, patient God, but we only get one chance to get it right the first time. Zechariah heard the thing he wanted to hear for so many years, and he got it wrong. Let's see how he got it wrong. The third, the fourth uh, message we take away from the story is Zechariah's mistake. Zechariah questioned God. Look what he says in verse 18. How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now, it sounds reasonable to me. Okay, dude, you're saying I'm going to have a, a baby? Uh, I'm too old. My wife's too old. Or maybe he's just saying in Old Testament fashion, I need a sign from God. Remember Gideon? The fleece, the dew on the fleece, and the dew not on the fleece and on the ground. Maybe he's just asking for a sign from God. But here's the thing. Where is Zechariah? Zechariah is in the holy place in the presence of God. 
serving at the altar that stands before God. And he's confronted by what he has no doubt is a supernatural being. Zechariah has no excuse to doubt Gabriel's message. That's why verse 18 is a mistake. Because Zechariah should have known better. And he got that one chance to get it right the first time. And he blew it. Wait a minute, Pastor Kevin. Aren't we supposed to test the spirits? Consider what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Isn't this what uh, Zechariah was doing? No, Zechariah was de- being disobedient because he knew this was from God. Now that could have been the end of the story. Gabriel could have said, wait, you blew it. God changed his mind. He's not going to do it. But then Gabriel goes on to pronounce the punishment for Zechariah's mistake. And the punishment is actually going to add to the magnitude of this miracle. So the fourth principle, the fourth undeniable truth that we see come out of this is God uses mistakes. I'm so grateful that we have a God that forgives and uses our mistakes. Think just for a moment about the worst mistake you've ever made. Whether it's a sin or whether it was just something really goofy and foolish and stupid. Think about a mistake you've made. How can God use that? I don't have the answer other than to say I know that God uses mistakes. How do I know that? He's used mine. Nobody who would stand up in front of you would be perfect. The truth is, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. Isn't that one of the problems we have with church nowadays? I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, Oh, Pastor Kevin, you know, one of these days I'm going to get myself straightened out and I'm going to go to church. Isn't that kind of backwards? You don't get yourself straightened out and then go to church. You go to church to get straightened out. We need to stop thinking like a church is a warehouse for perfect people and think of churches more like spiritual hospitals. We're here to heal the spiritual wounds and learn how to serve God even through our mistakes and we serve a God who uses us even though we've made mistakes. That's the lesson that Zachariah soon learned. Yes, did he have to go through a punishment? Yeah, there's, there's, there's often pain and difficulty with the consequences of our mistakes, but that doesn't mean God can't use them. We serve a God who uses even our mistakes. What a wonderful story. Now, the rest of the story is kind of like the spoiler. You know, we, 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 we dived into this passage to look at Zechariah's story today, to understand what was going through the mechanics and see what lessons God had learned. But let's just quickly fast forward through the spoilers. God did exactly what Gabriel, uh, what Gabriel said. Zechariah was mute. Elizabeth conceived and gave birth to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was born, lived, and died exactly how Gabriel said. The truth came out. So let's step back for a moment. Pastor, okay, that's a very nice story. It's a wonderful way to celebrate the Christmas holidays. It's very uplifting to see how God used Zechariah. What does that mean for me in my life? So let's see if there's some application that we can take away from these four principles today. From these four truths. The first truth, being used by God has a prerequisite. That we need to be righteous, blameless, and serving. What does that mean for me how I live right now in my life. God wants us to be holy. The Bible said, Be ye holy even as I am holy. We are called as God's people to be holy before our God. Something that is holy is pure. We are to live our lives holy before a holy God. And it's something that we're to continue to pursue even when we make mistakes. I'm not going to stand up before you and say that I'm perfect and I'm holy. It'd be foolish to say so. 
But I will say this, the deepest desire of my heart for my ministry is to be able to stand before my God someday and for my God to look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To make a difference with my life in an eternal way. Every single day of my life, I pray, Heavenly Father, make me a good father. Make me a good husband. Make me a good pastor. And make me a good employee at my secular work. Because every day, I want to learn to be holy before God. And that's the first thing we can understand from this undeniable truth of Zechariah, that we need to be holy. From the second undeniable truth, great pain often precedes a great move by God. I'm well aware that I may be addressing people today who have great pain in their life. Perhaps it's a a diagnosis of a terrible disease or a family member or a child who's recently died. Or maybe you've lost your home or you've lost your job or you're, you're facing some other struggle and you're in pain and your heart is aching as you're here before the Lord. In his book, When God Doesn't Make Sense, James Dobson said, we all come to that point when we hit the wall. And we look at God and we say, God, how could you do this to me? This doesn't make sense. It's not fair. It's not right. And we don't understand why God does it. And God doesn't promise we will always ever understand. But this is what I know. And I know this from personal experience. When you hit that wall, the only thing you can do is cling fervently to God. Like he's the only thing that can get you through. Because he is. When we are faced with that pain that is so deep, we can't even express it. Cling to Jesus. He will get you through it. The third truth, God gives us only one chance to get it right the first time. Means we need to learn to live deliberately. We need to learn to recognize those moments when God says, Oh, this is your first chance to get it right. Are you going to get it right? And with this one here, I'm going to give you a little homework. I wouldn't be a good teacher if I didn't give you homework, right? And all the teenagers said, oh, homework in church? Yeah, I'm I'm going to give you some homework. Sometime this month, you need to do this homework. I hope you get get to do it more than once. It's real simple. But this is a way that we can choose to live deliberately. I want you to help spread the gospel and evangelize the lost during this Christmas season. See, each year in the month of December, we get the opportunity as the people of God to proclaim the gospel, the good news, Jesus Christ is born. And we can evangelize, we can spread the good news and complete our homework with two words. And I want you to use these two words. Merry Christmas. Not happy holidays or happy Kwanzaa or happy Hanukkah. Those who celebrate those, you know, those holidays, that's fine. We celebrate Christ has come. Let's say Merry Christmas, and with our Merry Christmas, let people know we are celebrating the joy of the season and spreading the good news of the Messiah. Will you do your homework for me? Yes. Try it now. Say it for me. Merry Christmas. And number four, the fourth undeniable truth. I've lost my page. There it is. The God uses even our mistakes. It doesn't matter how big your mistake is. I have heard this before as a pastor. Oh, pastor, God can't use me. You don't understand what I've done. I've done horrible things. There's no way God could ever use me. Paul was a murderer. Can't get much worse than that, and God used him. The way that we overcome this as the people of God is to confess before God honestly. Have you made mistakes in your life that might be keeping God from using you today? Okay. Confess them before God and he will forgive you and you'll be surprised that he'll find a way to use your pain and use your mistakes and use the ache in your heart and use the things that you've done in your past for his glory. I'd like to close with a story about one person who said yes to God, and how it made such an incredible difference. Her name is Alice Seeley Harris, and it's outlined in the book by Justin Dillon, A Selfish Plan to Change the World. In the late 1800s, Leopold II, the king of Belgium, 
started colonizing the Congo, a land rich with natural resources such as rubber. At the same time, the demand for bicycle and car rubber was starting to spike. Within a few years' time, Leopold was enslaving millions of men, women, and children through brutal armed force to do the labor-intensive work of harvesting rubber. The pressure to fulfill this impossible rubber quotas fell on the brutal police force called the Force Publique. Now, to prove that the bullets that Leopold was sending to the Force Publique were being used to kill unproductive slave workers, Leopold required a severed hand or foot from every victim. So the soldiers stockpiled baskets of hands and feet to account for the bullets. It was a barbaric situation, but no one dared to rebel except a mild-mannered British missionary couple named John and Alice. Both felt a divine calling to this place to bring the love of Christ, but they also could not ignore the violence against the people they loved. So Alice had a brilliant idea. She grabbed her Kodak Brownie camera and started taking pictures, documenting the atrocities. She captured images of right hands cut off by forced public sentries. She documented mass graves. She documented tribesmen who were shackled together. This young woman with no professional photography skills collected images in order to topple an evil king she had never met. Alice and John had no plan, no strategy, certainly, or even a guarantee of success. In fact, her actions increased her chances of dying in the Congo. But news of the atrocities started to reach Europe. Churches, town halls, university lecture halls, parlors, halls of government, there wasn't a room that Alzheimer wasn't willing to bring her magic lantern to show. The people who came to witness her images and story were moved by this fearless woman. Her story spread quickly, making its way even into the writings of Mark Twain. Political and social pressure started to build against the Mad King's maniacal exploits. King Leopold II would ultimately be responsible for the deaths of close to 10 million people. But his stranglehold on the people of the Congo came to an end. And it all started with an unknown missionary and her cheap camera and a lot of courage. Alice Seeley Harris said yes to God. Will you? Would you stand with me, please? Heavenly Father, I humbly come before you this morning and I say yes. Lord, I want my life to make a difference to you. And Father, for the people who heard this message from your Holy Spirit this morning, I pray they would be able to say the same. Help us to be a church here in Middletown that says yes to you, that makes a difference that shines brightly with the light of the truth and the gospel. Help us to get it right the first time. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm going to ask you this morning, are you willing to say yes to God this morning? I'm going to ask one of our deacons to come forward as we come into this time of invitation. And perhaps in saying yes to God, you just need to come forward and pray quietly to God. The kneeling bench here at the altar is open. Or if you want to pray with the deacon and have a decision you need to make public, the altar is open for you now. But we only get one chance to get it right the first time. Let us not leave this place this morning without getting it right. As we sing now, would you come if the Lord leads you?